welcome everybody to Mornings with Planning, a webinar series hosted the first Wednesday of every month where the Lexington Division of Planning discusses new ways to reconnect, reimagine, and respond in a new reality. These webinars will be held live via Zoom and on Lex TV. It's also being recorded for later viewing at imaginelexington.com as well as this coming Saturday at 1 p.m. on Lex TV. This webinar is eligible for AICP credit. My name is Lauren Weaver, GISP and Senior Planner with the Lexington Division of Planning, and I will be your moderator for today's September 1st, 2021 session. During this webinar, we will be discussing history and exploring how looking back can help us to better move forward. So kick back with your morning coffee or tea, and let's meet today's panelists. So we have four excellent panelists today, including Peter Bourne, Lexington historian and blogger, Holly Wiedemann, president and owner of AU Associates, Dr. Doug Appler, AICP, chair and director of graduate studies for the Department of Historic Preservation at UK, and Hal Bailey, senior planner and AICP at the city of Lexington. Welcome everybody. Um, let's kick off today with a little bit of an overview of your roles within Lexington. Um, and we'll get started with Peter. So Peter, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your years of experience in planning and um, your work as a blogger, really focusing on your passion in history. Well, I, I started uh, in planning in 1972. I spent 37 years there before I moved into GIS. Uh, but that got me interested in the history, uh, the old maps, uh, being a cartographer of like. Uh, and that's, that's how I got into the history and the blogging and learning what we need to do for, for Lexington. Great, great. Holly, um, let's move into your background a little bit. So you have all kinds of historic projects and projects beyond historic as well, um, including the old Fayette County Courthouse, which looks great, by the way. Um, and you've managed to use like historic tax credits and have won a bunch of awards, including a bunch of awards for historic preservation and adaptive reuse. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about those things and anything else. Sure. Thank you, Lauren, and, and thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be here. I actually um, was born in Lexington, and um, it seems as though there, there are fewer and fewer of us that, that are actually native Lexingtonians. But um, so I've had the opportunity to see Lexington grow and evolve from a, from a sleepy little town. I think when I was born, it had less than 120,000. And um, so it was pretty small. And um, that, that's gonna be fun to talk about from a standpoint of growth and development. But um, I started AU 31 years ago this year and the focus was on um, and continues to be on adaptive use, which is part of the reason that AU is AU. It's also the, uh, if you remember your periodic tables, um, it stands for gold, Aurum. But um, so we do both urban infill and new construction, but all of my, most of my urban infill when, when AU, when I started AU was really the adaptive reuse of historic buildings and converting them into affordable housing and some mixed income and also some commercial space. So um, we, we now have um, 35 people. We have our own property management company because we manage everything we develop. And um, AU is, uh, I, am, I have just an amazing team and we love what we do. And I have always had a passion for historic buildings. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. I grew up in one and um, I think that's probably what, what launched me, but just the whole notion of, of um, adaptively reusing buildings that have outlived their original use is, is the best form of recycling and uh, reducing a carbon footprint and being green. So yeah. it, all, it works on all levels for me. Well, thank you for being here this morning. I will admit I, I'm, 
I always want to know what the letters stand for and business names. And so when I was learning more about your background, I was looking at your website to figure out what AU stands for. So now that riddle is solved. Uh, so thank you Great. for being here. Looking forward to hearing more in this conversation. All thank right, you. Doug. Uh, so I understand you have a master's and a PhD based in planning and you're also AICP. But right now you're working at UK um, in historic preservation in the College of Design, I believe. Uh, and you really focus on, from what I've read, the role of innovation with historic resources and public policy. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so as you say, my, my background, um, I used to be a professional planner. I worked down in Madison County, Georgia for a number of years, was the planning and zoning director of a fairly small county. Um, our biggest claim to fame was that we were the third largest producer of poultry in the state of Georgia. Um, which is a you know legit claim to fame. Um, after that, went back to uh, went back to school and got a PhD um, up at Cornell and uh, again in historic preserve. I'm sorry, in in planning, uh, but with a focus on historic resources. So basically, part of my my dissertation work was a big part of it was looking at cities that had adopted um, city archaeology ordinances and kind of trying to understand one how those work, um, but also what the public benefits of those ordinances were in terms of um, and it turns out there are quite a few. Um, I could you know, give you the whole lecture on, on how they benefit the public, but, um, but really the places that have thought carefully about their history and how to use it and how to bring it into the, the modern day, um, really those places do well. Um, they, they benefit the public in a number of ways. Um, so really that kind of started me along that line. And so just thinking in terms of how, um, you know, how the public uses its historic resources or doesn't use its historic resources in some cases, unfortunately, when people think they're innovating, sometimes they wind up, um, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater and getting rid of what makes them special. Um, so you have to watch out for that too. Some of my more recent work has uh, focused on urban renewal, um, which is a period when people were trying to be very creative with their downtowns, but um, in the process often wound up uh, really changing things, uh, in some cases for the worse. Um, some cases for the better, but some cases for the worse. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I'm where I'm coming from these days. And yeah, now I am the, uh, the chair of the, uh, Historic Preservation Department here in the College of Design at UK. Um, I just took on that role at the beginning of July, so I'm still kind of uh, you know warming up the seat and getting comfortable here. But um, you know, it's uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to being in this position for hopefully a, a good long while. Yeah. Well, welcome and uh, congratulations on your Thanks. chair position. It's been cool to see how that uh, department at UK has continued to grow and evolve, and I think probably will continue to as something like design and urban renewal is also evolving. So welcome aboard. All right, Hal, uh, let's wrap up these intros with some of your background. So we had you on a panel before talking a little bit about infill and redevelopment, and we're glad to welcome you back for this panel. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your previous work also in um, cultural resource management and historic preservation, and then how that ties into your work in planning services with the Division of Planning now? Great. Thank you for having me today. And it's nice to be back with the mornings with planning. Um, initially, uh, my before my career in planning, I worked in archaeology and anthropology. I have a master's in anthropology from the University of Colorado uh, with a focus in archaeology. I worked in cultural resource management uh, from a private sector, as well as for the National Park System, uh, focused on preservation, recordation, and kind of the, the, the management of historic preservation. I did that for a number of years uh, and, and really uh, had a wonderful time during that, but noticed a real uh, problem or a lack of infrastructure for preservation. Uh, much of cultural resource management is recording so that something new can go in or replace that historical or prehistoric past. Um, and, and I felt a little bit disappointed in, in some of the rail guards that were set up uh, to, to make sure that our past is preserved and presented to the public in a very meaningful way. Uh, so at that point, I kind of shifted trajectories, went back and got another master's in uh, urban planning uh, with a, a little bit of a focus on land use and how uh, different land uses kind of interact as well as how we can promote the past or, and when we talk about the past, it's not really that thing in the, in the background or anything like that, it's the lived experience in the past. Um, it continues to influence how we build, construct, move throughout our lives. And uh, I, I 
felt that uh, within my, in my perspective of land use planning and in my current position in zoning, I get to interact with that uh, quite a bit. Uh, we get to play with what needs to change in our ordinances so that we can promote certain things, but also uh, what is the context of certain locations what, with their uses, with how they're being inter interacted with the public. So I, I've really been able to, from my previous work history, been able to kind of delve into a lot of that with what I'm currently doing now with the city. So it's been a great experience and it, it just leads us to be able to continue to grow. Yeah, that's really great. And I think it's super valuable to have that background in planning as well, where we're just trying to find that balance for urban renewal and preservation. Um, so audience, you can see we have a great panel today. Um, we have a bunch of questions that were received during registration, but also feel free to use the Q&A functionality in your Zoom meeting. If you're on Lex TV, um, you don't have that, unfortunately. But if, if you're in Zoom, you do have that Q&A if you'd like to submit an additional question. And I'll work to integrate that into the questions that we have coming up. All right. So I'd like to start with a kickoff question. And maybe we can keep it with you, Hal, uh, for the start of a kickoff question. But this is a question for each of you. Uh, so what is something about the past, perhaps unexpected, that you'd like to share? Open range, it can be anything you like. <laughs> oh, I, I think the, the interacting with the past is the most important thing. We all, all too often think of history as being something that isn't something that we get to uh, have a part of. Um, it's something that occurred hundreds of years ago, and uh, it remains 100 years ago. I think that with the work that Holly is doing and, and a lot of the work that Doug has written about and the work that Peter has also written about, it's all about interacting with that space and uh, kind of tying that history into our own lived experiences. Whether it's getting a piece of pizza over at Goodfellas, which is also the location of Cassius Clay's old office in which he had two cannons pointed out the window to protect himself during an abolition period. Uh, or it is going to Gray Line Station, which was uh, acting as a uh, place of uh, transit movement and is now being reformed and, and changed into a place of uh, neighborhood commerce, as well as just overall uh, just resources for neighborhoods. I, I think that that lived past in Lexington uh, really plays through and, and, and really can connect people to different things. Thank you. All right. Well, anybody feel free to jump in. Holly, go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the things that, that I love about what we do is that we take so many different types of historic buildings that have, that have had a different life. And part of what we do when we, when we adaptively reuse them and, and what's so important about being able to utilize historic tax credits is looking at every single feature of what that made that building, that building, and what is indigenous to its use. As an example, um, we did a federal building slash post office in Jackson, Kentucky. It was built in 1913, and it has these beautiful Palladian windows. It's, it's absolutely a jewel box. And I learned a lot about historic post offices and how they were constructed because they had these um, catwalks to be able to watch the workers and the catwalks actually even no matter what the workers were doing even if they were on break in the restrooms for pity's <laughs> sakes and so and there were there were some weird tunnels and all kinds of, if you opened a door at a dead end, you could drop, um, you know, three floors. And, you know, I guess that was for mail, but it was a full, it was a full door that someone, if they weren't the wiser, could walk right through. Huh. Um, we also did an old TB hospital in Ashland, Kentucky, and converted that to affordable housing for survivors of domestic violence. One of the things about TB at the time was the importance of having sunrooms, the importance of having lots of circulation of air uh, because of the, of, the, of the whole 
re respiratory issues that someone with TB has. And interestingly, the, the uh, motif that was carved into the limestone later became the uh, brand identification for the American Cancer Society, which is huh. interesting, um, which has got a double cross, essentially, um, a, a vertical with, with two horis horizontal lines. Um, and the schools that we do are all interesting, but to Hal's point, the importance of, of having a building in its original configuration and recognizing its, its value, but then being able to adaptively reuse it while still respecting its past. I, I neglected to say what my education was, and I went to the University of Georgia undergrad for landscape architecture and urban planning with a focus on urban design um, and land use planning. And um, after working in architecture and design and land use, I then figured out I needed to get uh, learn the financial end of it, so I got an MBA. I don't tell many people here that it was from Duke. <laughs> But anyway, um, living in Boston, that was where I first worked and seeing the amount of history that is everywhere there, um, that that is steeped in. I, I will tell you, just leave with this one last little point. You recognize the value of history, particularly in, in Europe. I, was, I had a fellowship for a year after, after undergrad in England and I was in the, city of Rye, and I saw a, the cornerstone of, of a building restored 1614. I thought, okay, <laughs> this building was restored then, <laughs> not built. That was just restored. So anyway, that's my uh, little tidbit on the past. Thank you for that background. It's really neat to hear about how you have this historical context that helps you to integrate those features, hopefully in a safer way than walking out a door and falling several stories. Um, yeah, and, and to the point of um, the European history, I think that makes a good case for the value of historic preservation in our very young nation. We're, we're just little pups compared to Europe uh, so far, so thank you. All right, anybody, is there anybody who would like to go next? Doug, Peter? Sure, um, happy to say a few words. Um, maybe this is taking it in a slightly different direction than, um, than other folks were, were taking Take it. it. In terms of my interesting little tidbit about Lexington and its, its planning history, um, if you actually wanna to get to know about, you, know, you think of the south side of Lexington as being the area where the, you know, it's, it's the suburban part of the town, right? Um, but if you actually want to get to know about the history of suburbia, the place to find out about it is in the north side of town. So if you actually go up, if you start on Loudon Ave uh, and just walk down Loudon Ave and sort of walk around the neighborhood um, that surrounds um, Loudon Ave and, and Castlewood Park, you can actually see through the progression of different styles and the progression of different building types, how it started off as, you know, Castlewood, the, the house, Loudon House in about 1850 or so when it was built big, grand, high-style uh, Gothic Revival house way out in the country from when it was built. And then you gradually see a couple of smaller, but still very impressive um, you know, Richardsonian Romanesque houses being built right along Loudon Ave and right along where they put the trolley line. Then you start to see smaller, but still very impressive houses. And as time sort of moves forward or moves on, you can start to see the houses sort of change in style and become smaller until you arrive at the Castlewood Park um, the houses that surround Castlewood Park now, which were built in the 1950s or so. Um, so you just sort of see this progression of, of building types and styles as suburbia sort of becomes the dominant mode of, um, you know, of, of growth for most of, um, for most of Lexington at the time. So it's kind of fun. It's a little um, planning history sort of tour if you want to do that sometime. Um, the history of the origins of suburbia in Lexington would actually start you off on that end of town um, as opposed to the south side. Thank you for that. I'm over in that area pretty regularly. So next time I'm cycling through, I'm going to have a different perspective, <laughs> which is always valuable. Peter, do you well, like to take I, it from here? I, thank you. I, I, I believe that when the uh, urban service area was initiated, it was to stop uh, sprawl. 
But Lexington has had a long history of uh, leapfrog growth. Uh, when you look at the woodland area, you figure that it was uh, planted in 1887, uh, and it was at the edge of town at that time. It was right on the, the uh, uh, city limits line, uh, actually overlapped it. Uh, but it was two or three farms away from where urban development was at the time. And uh, it was leapfrog. It uh, was actually developed after the A&M College moved or left its uh, property there and moved to where the main campus is now. So if the university or if the college and now university had never moved, mm -hmm. they would have been on the Woodland property and the Ashland Park property. If that had developed as the university, all its university development would have gone out Richmond Road rather than Nicholasville Road. And the whole dynamic of downtown uh, and growth uh, possibly would have changed. So uh, the urban service area did not actually stop leapfrog growth, but it, uh, it did severely limit it a bit. Thank you. Yeah, it's always interesting. Peter, it's always interesting to hear about your background in the history of Lexington. I always learn something new talking with you. Uh, okay, cool. Well, let's move into a new question. I think maybe this is a good one to start off with Hal. Um, so this one is about patterns of development. So what kind of patterns of development have influenced how flow of people and parcels move through Lexington's history. And I think Peter might have some insight on this that he's already alluded to a little bit. So how start us off. I think Peter's uh, discussion points have it kind of leads into this really well and the fact that it, a lot of different private and public interests kind of lead to the uh, often organic, sometimes manipulated perspective of how we develop our city. Um, so the, the original downtown, what we consider the downtown portion of town, you have your gridded kind of system, and then we get into our radial arterial road systems and, and a few other kind of modifications in that time. Uh, the different shifts in construction history, as well as mobility patterns, really uh, affect not only how things have been developed in the past, but how we move through our city currently, uh, as well as how we have to make up for some of those things that we've missed in the past. Uh, I say make up for a lot of our suburbanized areas weren't built with sidewalks in mind, or a lot of our historic areas were built uh, for people to walk around and not for an F-250 uh, dual <laughs> rear wheel kind of truck or anything like that. So uh, all too often we are dealing with the interaction of how things, the, the built environment uh, that is there and how we are modifying them for the future. Uh, I think it's also really important to look at how things have been done from a social perspective, especially with planning. Uh, if we look at things like the east side or the north side uh, in which there were a uh, there was a real strong focus on uh, segregating the Black population within Lexington and then the private covenances that have kind of, that were a very big part of Lexington's past in which there were deed restrictions on uh, the race of individual or the ethnicity of the individual that could be in a specific neighborhood. Those uh, kind of developments from both the private and public side permeate into our kind of development patterns today. Um, and they, they do really modify how uh, and where we can change going on into the future. Uh, Charles Young Park is actually a wonderful case example of uh, how the population of Lexington, specifically the Black population in Lexington, really push for services to be developed within their area. Uh, which were lacking until the 1950s and 60s, uh, and uh, that have led to some changes. But the areas of development that have occurred really permeate to now, and uh, within planning and, and zoning specifically, we need to be cognizant of some of those uh, things that have influenced the past and, and now us in the present. 
Absolutely. Those are great points. I think that ties in well to a lot of the the work being done in equity right now, too, in that we absolutely have to look back and also look at our present situation in order to move forward more productively. So thank you for that. Peter, do you want to chime in there? Well, Hal's right about the uh, the deed restrictions and, and covenants uh, and the uh, the way that we have developed some of our, the way we look at uh, subdivisions these days is that they, they grow very quickly. You know, somebody will go out there and they'll throw up a couple of hundred houses. Uh, the older ones grew much more slowly. Uh, you would pick up, uh, uh, my favorite again is the Woodland subdivision, started in the 1800s. And the, some of the last houses were built uh, along Ashland Avenue somewhere in the late 19 teens. Uh, so uh, we didn't grow near as quickly. Uh, I, think, I think that helps uh, figure out where we're going. Absolutely. I I've also bike by Ashland regularly, and it's astounding to me to look at these like majestic historic homes and think that they were built a hundred years ago. <laughs> Holly, would you like to chime in there? Sure. Um, two little points. One, um, it was the late 50s, early 60s when um, I'd say a watershed moment happened in Lexington, and that was when IBM moved here. And I would tell you that the, I can remember hearing all the adults at the time saying, this is going to ruin Lexington because we're going to have these, you know, blue suits in here and they will not understand the horse farms. They're, they're from out of town and it's just terrible because then we don't want Lexington to grow. Growth was a bad word. Mm. And um, because as, as it still is, frankly, that which is, as, as we all know, Lexington was one of the first places in the country to develop the urban service area to kind of restrict the growth, which was really a, um, a far-sighted, capability to, to do that. And it's, it's pretty unusual. And I think it reinforces the fact that our horse farms are our fa factory floor in many ways besides Toyota, but um, to Peter's point on leapfrogging. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, before we moved back out into the country to a house where my mother had grown up and her parents had grown up. We had a house behind, um, uh, on a farm right behind the Campbell House golf course. And um, I could actually ride my pony from our farm to the Red Mile and there was <laughs> nothing in between, which That's is hard, awesome. to, hard to believe. Uh, but that, I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago, but in fact, if you think about it, it was, it was definitely a lifetime ago. But the amount of development that occurred um, then, and you know, obviously our downtown has had, like all downtowns in the United States, a, a uh, period of ebb and flow. And when I was little, our, our family owned Purcell's department store which was a real big deal and it anchored, there were so many people walking down the streets in Lexington that you could barely get from one end of Maine to the other. And it was a very lively place until, until um, Turflin Mall and urban removal as, as it was called then um, happened because downtowns across across the United States just began to dry up and die because a mall was something revolutionary and new and different. And it just kind of shifted how retail was done. And we're probably back there now, given the pandemic and how retail is being done now. I think we're gonna to continue to see a lot of changes on how, how development and planning occurs based upon 
our, um, you know, what happens in our society and the pandemic definitely, I believe is gonna have far reaching impacts that we don't even realize at this point of how people work and retail and office and all of that. But anyway, that's, um, we're, it, it's an it's a organism that continues to evolve based upon a lot of external and internal factors. Thank you for that. And we're seeing a shift back to people wanting to walk more and bike more. One of my favorite, I've mentioned biking a couple times already, but one of my favorite things is when I'm cycling on the roads of Main Street with my bike trailer and I pass like a, an F-250 with also a trailer and I'm like, hey, <laughs> we're the same. For the same, but I love this image of you riding your pony past a bustling main street, even like outside of the business hours. Um, so I think we're seeing more of a return to that and, and perhaps a, and a, even a quickening of that with the pandemic and people turning to more outside activities. Okay, I think Doug may be a good person to kick us off on this next one, but of course anybody should feel free to weigh in. Um, so this turns more to economic development. Um, so how do you see historic preservation being used to generate um, economic development? And maybe how do you tie that into preservation of historic structures versus um, the destruction of those structures or the total reformation that you kind of mentioned at the beginning? Sure, I'm happy to, to chime in, although I have to say, I think this is probably as much more Holly's area of expertise given that she's uh, <laughs> done exactly that. Um, but sure, just in a big picture sense, I mean, you can think about lots of different ways that preservation generates economic activity and economic development. I mean, from one perspective, you're taking, in many cases, again, speaking to what Holly uh, might be, be doing, you take a white elephant building it's, that's sitting there and it's not really serving a, a, a purpose. It's not generating anything. It's not doing anything for anyone besides just sort of being an eyesore or a reminder of, of days gone past or something like that. And then you take that building and the process of bringing it back to life and that part of it, just the, the construction part of it, generates all different kinds of economic activity from you know, the materials that you're ordering to put into the building, from the installation of the building to the finishing of the building, and then to actually getting people in the building and starting their new businesses there. Um, you know, all that money just sort of ripples out into the economy um, from you know, the raw material suppliers and then the, uh, the salespeople who are selling it. And then everybody else just, you know, that money moves when you invest in a historic building. And I think it's important to remember also that particularly for historic buildings, because the level of craftsmanship has to be so high and because the, um, you know, you're having to do a lot of that repair and um, repair work as opposed to installing new, um, new materials necessarily, there's a lot of labor. There's even more labor than there typically is for a new building in a lot of cases. So I think the, the saying is that the split is something like it's either 60, 40 um, for you know, maybe 60, 40 or maybe 70, 30 in terms of the percentage um, of, the, of the effort that goes into a building being 70% you know, labor for a historic building and 30% uh, materials costs, whereas for a new building, it's the reverse. It's mostly materials costs, which may be, you may be sending that material, you may be sending that money to, you know, plants that are outside the city or plants that are, uh, in some cases, even outside the country, um, if you're talking about, you know, drywall or other things like that. Uh, whereas if you're restoring a historic building, so much more of that money actually stays in uh, the local community because you're paying folks to do the, the manual labor. Um, so from one perspective, you know, you've got that economic argument that says, you know, taking a historic building and bringing it back to life is going to generate a certain amount of activity there. But also, if you're thinking about things like, you know, we just talked about downtowns a little bit, if you talk about things like the Main Street program, the National Trust Main Street program, that I think a lot of folks are familiar with, um, it really is much more than just, you know, people might think of it as being sort of a, a pretty committee, you know, folks that go around hanging baskets on the light posts to make it look nice and whatnot. Um, but it really is probably one of the most effective tools for economic development for small towns that has really been developed in the last 50 years. I mean, beyond, um, you know, it's, it's a great way of creating, of taking those downtowns that are so vital for, for small communities and bringing them back to life after they've been almost killed off by the mall that opened up on the bypass or wherever else it may be. Um, when you can bring that downtown back to life by, you know, helping to incubate new businesses, doing the historic preservation work to bring those buildings back to life, uh, getting people to spend time with each other, building those social networks, building those business relationships among the different businesses that are downtown, organizing those events um, to actually get people downtown to make them think of downtown as being a destination again, as opposed to just something to pass through. Um, that's really what the Main Street program does. And it helps to get, um, make those downtowns places again. And so, you know, when we talk about um, the relationship between preservation and, and growth or economic development, 
you know, in some quarters, preservation has a bad rap because people think we're always just trying to say no to everything. But really what we're doing in those situations is creating spaces for entrepreneurs to let their businesses take off. Mm -hmm. And preservation plays a major role in, in just creating that environment where people want to be, where they want to spend time, where they want to spend their money. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a significant force for economic development. And I'll hand it off to Holly because I know she's got much more to add to this. Thank you. Yeah, and I am confident Holly will have plenty to weigh in on this. And Holly, I wonder if you mind to also mention um, in your contribution to this, uh, the role of historic tax credits, which I understand you're adept in navigating. Absolutely. Thank you. And Doug, you did a great job. And that's, that's a terrific foundation because that is certainly the, the job creation, particularly of artisan craftspeople um, is really important. And a lot of that does cause, um, because of the specialized nature of it, causes work to stay in specific communities. Um, a, a couple of things that, that I'll touch on. As an example, the historic courthouse um, would not have happened but for historic tax credits. I was able to generate $11 million in historic tax credits, which is all private. Um, I syndicated that through Old National Bank. And that is how it was a combination of both state and federal credits. And that was at no cost to the city, no cost to anybody. And this building generated 850 jobs through construction and more than 100 permanent jobs because of uh, WIDA's restaurant, the bar, the event space, the caterers, and it will continue to generate more than a quarter of a million dollars annually that will go back to the um, city. So it, it, and that's after it's already paying all of its expenses, it will never be a drain on on the economy, it's a contributor, not to mention the amount of economic development that that has stimulated around it. I actually, um, because we do so many historic properties all over the state of Kentucky and West Virginia, I commissioned many years ago a, a um, economic study, an economic impact study with um, the chair of the University of Chicago, Jeffrey Hewings, who is a, who's an economist. And because I wanted to be able to understand, and when I went to speak to politicians and lobby for historic tax credits, I wanted to have a real solid fact-based understanding of what, uh, what historic preservation is responsible for and the economic impact. And I did a rural project um, and also an urban project just to see how many, you know, what the economic impact was. And so what I can tell you is that over the course of AU's life and with the development of, and adaptive reuse of these buildings, we have created over 8,700 jobs across hmm. Kentucky predominantly in Kentucky and also in areas of West Virginia. But that's, that's a lot of jobs and a huge impact on the economy for, you know, for, for every one of the communities in which we're located. Uh, because that tertiary and secondary impact spills over to um, food, to restaurants, to gas stations, to, you know, all the supportive services that are then, you know, get a, get an economic boost. So that, um, that's it in a nutshell. And um, the, the other thing, as I mentioned earlier, just the carbon footprint of the embodied energy in historic buildings, we're not tearing them down, we're not increasing landfill issues you know, we, it is it is all the right thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, that's all very interesting from the economic as well as the carbon footprint perspective. Hal, do you want to chime in on this one? It, just, just quickly, and I know we have a Go lot of other questions and a, a little bit of time. But, we never uh, get to all the questions. It's okay. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, well, I, I mean, just the perspective of the economic development side of uh, the zoning aspect of historic preservation. Uh, zoning and uh, preservation are innately tied with the economic side of things, uh, the, the legal implications associated with preservation for, let's say, our H1 overlay, which is our historic district overlay, is actually directly tied to the economics of those areas. Uh, so many of the times it is tied to either the value of the property. Now, a lot of the times as a preservationist or a archeologist, we talk of that as the, the social value of these places. But for the legal impl implications of establishing these overlays, uh, it's often tied to the economic situation of the average reciprocity of distribution and of uh, benefits and burn burdens. So you're, you're establishing this kind of base in which everybody knows what you can and cannot do on your property and uh, or with the exterior of your property, really. And that really ties to the economic value of that property. Typically, when we see a historic district or something like that being applied, whether it's applied to the structures or the lotting patterns, uh, it, it, you see a direct correlation to the value of that property economically. Uh, typically, you see anywhere between a 5 and 15% rise in the property value uh, for that area. Now, those can be really great things. They, they can help uh, a neighborhood develop equity in their property. They can also be detrimental at times in the fact that they price people out from historic neighborhoods. So uh, that behooves us uh, from a planning perspective to really delve into how do we make sure that uh, historic areas and historic uh, resources are available not only to those that can afford them, but to those that are part of Lexington. Uh, the, the broader public in general. Um, so it, that's just it kind of the, the up and down of the uh, economic side for a zoning perspective of historic preservation, which can often be a blunt tool in a very, very nuanced kind of discussion. Yeah, thank you for that. That ties in really well to this next question. And I'd like to start off with Peter. Uh, and it ties in really well because what we are seeing is that property values are increasing in areas that are more walkable. And often that is the older neighborhoods, though not exclusively. And so we have this challenge of how do we continue to grow and also keep our older neighborhoods preserved and create the kind of society that people want to live in. So Peter, can you talk to a little bit to how we preserve um, our older neighborhoods and also continue to construct new areas that are walkable and valuable? Uh, I actually don't have a, a real good answer of how we do it. Uh, it's just that people want it to be done and it may be done in spite of our planning rather than because of our planning. Hmm. Uh, when I look back at uh, one of my favorite neighborhoods, the Woodland area, it was all built as residential. It was all platted as residential. There was no business in that area in 1887. Uh, it uh, became the business area of the Woodland Triangle because the people needed it to be there and it evolved that way. If there had been historic preservation at the time, maybe it wouldn't have happened. If the zoning laws had been in place at the time, it couldn't have happened. So uh, I look at uh, how, do we, how do we make it into an area we want to live in? Uh, we sometimes have to let it evolve. We have to let uh, the development come. Uh, and just let, let the city evolve which right now I don't believe the zoning laws will allow us to do that uh, as it should be done. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, and if um, folks are interested in the, the zoning ordinance and also changes coming up, I would encourage you to check out the imaginelexington.com website to stay apprised of what changes are being proposed and get involved in that as well. Um, I see both Doug and Holly are looking to chime in. I think Doug unmuted first, so why don't you take it? <laughs> okay, I'll be quick. Um, Go for it. I want to try to kind of connect to um, 
some of the conversation that we were just having a little bit earlier about preservation and sustainability and how they kind of plug in together. And to Hal's point, um, it's important to remember that when we talk about sustainability, we're not just talking about, you know, reducing the amount of energy consumption of a building. You're talking about the social aspects of sustainability as well. Sustainability isn't ever just about um, reducing energy consumption. It's about the consequences of your actions for you know, the surrounding society and for future generations and everything else like that. So I think one of the challenges facing preservation moving forward and one of the areas of that are good, frankly gonna be the most exciting is looking at those tools that effectively pair the preservation and reuse of historic resources with uh, social equity goals. And so when we talk about things like low income housing tax credits being paired with historic preservation tax credits, which again, Holly's very familiar with, you know, that's one of those tools where you can say, yeah, we're preserving this historic building, but we're also creating affordable housing, even in some cases as a byproduct. It's kind of funny to think of it that way, but it's you're accidentally creating affordable housing. There aren't very many programs that do that. But the low income housing tax credit program and the historic preservation tax credit, when you plug them together, um, it does that. Um, another kind of tool, and this kind of, again, goes into that idea that um, when you mentioned in the introduction of the idea of sort of studying innovation and historic preservation practice in local government, there are some places, um, again, I hate to use Portland. Um, everybody's kind of sick of hearing about Portland, Oregon. I know, I know, they do everything great. Well, well. But one of the things that they're doing um, that they've started to do is they're actually using um, tax increment financing funds in their historic downtown neighborhood in the Pearl. And they're saying, I think it's something along the lines of 40% of the TIF funds that get approved for that area have to go towards building affordable housing. So they're pairing their TIF funds with, uh, with affordable housing production. So it's not just a question of, and you can use those funds to rehab historic buildings in the Pearl. So it's, it's again, you're taking all these different ideas and you're, you're putting them together at the same time. You're saying, you wanna have the historic buildings. You wanna have increased economic activity. You want you know, the historic buildings to sort of be the center of that, but you also don't wanna displace the folks who've been living there for the previous 20 years. You know, they lived through the worst of it. Now you'd like to be able to get them to see some of the best of it. So you have to use those policy, it's, you have to proactively put those policies in place because if you just take an approach of saying, all right, well, we're gonna make this, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna focus our, our economic development efforts on this neighborhood. And, um, you know, if rents go up, hey, that's a great thing because it means landlords can make more money or things are worth more, tax revenues go up, blah, blah, blah. That's not really a sustainable way of framing uh, economic development or a sustainable way of framing historic preservation. Um, so really we have to look at those places where, uh, where those innovative policies are coming into effect and put them together as we have already done with historic preservation and the low-income housing tax credit, um, look for other tools that are out there and put them together and start reframing the way we think about preservation activities as being about the building and about the people who are in the neighborhood already. Not that we aren't, many of us are already doing that, but it's, it's, it needs to become common practice. Thank you for that. And Holly, I know you had already unmuted, but I'm excited to hear about your work in affordable housing. I think often in conversations, it is this conversation of like affordable housing or things that are good for lower socioeconomic groups versus historic preservation and affluence. And we know that's not true across the board. So um, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this. Sure. Yeah, I, I would have three, three thoughts on, on this particular topic. But first, we do, um, it's complex, it's hard. Um, and but we do it and have done it for 31 years, combining historic tax credits with affordable housing tax credits. Um, it's, it's hard to do. And usually those projects are much smaller um, because they're not huge historic buildings. So the fact of the matter is that's why a lot of people don't do it. Um, number one, because of the complexity of it. But secondly, it can take longer to do a smaller project with these different innovative financial um, mechanisms than it can do to do a great big, you know, suburban, as, uh, as Peter said, when they just, you know, all of a sudden it's like freeze dried housing, they're 200 units. Well, I can't do that. <laughs> um, certainly not with, not with historic housing, but that does solve a lot of the issues that Hal was referencing with regard to gentrification, because that all the buildings that we've done in certainly in in Eastern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, um, and West Virginia are historic buildings that are oftentimes the abandoned icons of, of neighborhoods, whether they're schools or some of the other examples I gave earlier, but by Combining those, 
um, many, as an example, many of our schools, the, we often do seniors housing. We have to very carefully tuck in an elevator because we have to make all of our units fully mm -hmm. adaptable for our seniors. And the seniors love it because they oftentimes went to school there, they taught there, their children went there, their grandchildren went there. And it is bringing back to its former glory um, a building that is that is iconic to to the to the community. Um, something else I wanted to mention with regard to a lot of the historic neighborhoods, and we can see that in the uh, South Hill area, there are big buildings, big houses, right cheek to jowl with little, very small houses, and. Unfortunately, in a lot of subdivisions or new construction areas, you can only build a house of a certain size because everybody wants a, a big house and not to live right next door to a little house. But I would, I would submit to you that I think the uh, charm of the historic areas of South Hill is the different house sizes, which solve the problem with regard to square footage and cost and everything else and allow that opportunity to have different income levels live next to each other. Um, but, the, but the last item that I'd also like to say that also touches on the H1 overlay, um, the, build, the development that I did, uh, well, the building that I'm in, sitting in was um, one of the oldest buildings in the Western suburb, which is the oldest neighborhood in Lexington. And we're right on old Georgetown Street. And our building, if you go down in the basement, we actually have tree trunks that serve oh. as the beams. And, and uh, I saw that, that uh, Valerie, I think, put up on the, the chat or from Samantha. Anyway, you can see, if you go look at the uh, Sanborn fire insurance maps, you can see the evolution of neighborhoods. And when I looked this building up, I couldn't find anything prior to um, when it had been last sold in 1799, so, or transferred. So I don't know what the history of this building was before then, but if I could do a carbon 14 on these tree trunks, I'd love to see, you know, when, when, they, were, when they were cut down. But our tech, which is, a prime example of urban infill, these were three vacant lots with an old burned down funeral home. And now it's um, 38 units that are absolutely beautiful, all within walking distance. And they, I developed this because the neighborhood asked me to, and given that it's in an H1 overlay, we took we took specific details from the surrounding neighborhood, like the fenestration, the window patterns, the roof patterns, and looked at the Sanborn maps to discover that most everything on this street is at an angle. And we mirrored the context of the surrounding neighborhood so that not only are we a good neighbor, but we reflect and basically just reinterpreted the architectural details in a very fresh and innovative way. And that is what you can also do where you can be respectful to the H1 overlay and yet do new construction that, that um, doesn't mimic, but interprets some of the historic character of the, of the neighborhood in a, in a fresh manner. But, Anyway, the, the tools that are at, at anyone's, um, they're, they're available to anybody. It, it's just, it's hard and complex and it, you can make a whole lot more money if you, if you go, go uh, do suburban new construction. But, you yeah. know, got, I've, I have chosen to follow my passion and very glad that that's what we do. Sure. Yeah. Something that I often reflect on is the like ROI in general of work. Um, so there's, and I'm not a super financially driven person, but there's like ROI in financial dollars. But if we expand that concept more as like next level approaches to humanity to what is the social impact? What is 
the what are the outcomes that are adverse here by taking this approach, I think we get a much better development and a much better society. So thank you for providing such a good example of how we can help multifamily housing integrate into the surrounding community and how that is a value to everybody who's there, um, including more affluent groups. I think that's just a wonderful, inspiring example of how it can work. And I would say your ROI is probably higher, even if the financial isn't as high as- Well, actually, you know, I, I will tell you from my perspective, and fortunately for everyone who works here, we can do good and also do well. And that is pretty much how we, how we focus on this. And, um, you know, the fact that we can employ 35 people, we're doing fine. And um, I have to balance big projects with little projects. I don't have the luxury of doing the little, little ones that, that um, I love just because I've got a big payroll every two weeks. <laughs> but it's a balance, every, as is everything. As is everything. So we're already here at the end. These always go so quickly. I'm always begging for 90 minute webinars. I don't know how many people would stay around for 90 minutes, but we're already at our concluding question. Um, so Doug, maybe you can wrap in what you were gonna say with your concluding answer perhaps. <laughs> sure. um, so the, the final question um, would be if you wanna leave anybody with anything, but especially looking to the future, what's a valuable takeaway to help us avoid the mistakes of the past and move better as we look forward. Um, Doug, would you like to kick us off on that? Okay, uh, sort of trying to mash everything into a response. <laughs> Building on a couple of points that, um, you know, that have been made both by Holly and by Hal uh, in the last question. Both of you mentioned the idea of having smaller, you know, having smaller houses next to larger houses and um, thinking in terms of you know, making sure that you um, can address the needs of, of a diverse population, large groups of you know, people who are at different stages of their lives. You know, the city got real close with those accessory dwelling units. And I really want to, I know people might think that historic preservationists would be opposed to ADUs popping up in backyards. That's how you're going to get that increased density, even within historic districts. And that's what the city's historic development pattern actually used to have. We used to have a lot of small dwelling units at the back of the big house, or whether it was, you know, in a different format or something like that. We used to have that diversity of dwelling type in downtown and other parts of, of Lexington. And it's only because zoning over the course of its existence has made those types of structures more difficult um, to, to maintain and to keep uh, that you don't see them anymore. And so now people think of that as being the norm. The reality is that the city grew up with smaller houses mixed in with larger houses, not every single house fronted on the street. Uh, you know, there was a lot of diversity in terms of how the city grew and what its, its urban form was. And I really, the ADUs provide a way, in my mind anyway, um, to, to sort of recreate that very successful historic development pattern. Not that there aren't issues that you have to resolve to make sure that everybody's happy and, and comfortable with that level of, of growth. But um, you know, when you talk about how you're gonna grow in a historic city without tearing down your existing historic structures, putting those ADUs at the back of the, of the property or at the side of the property, allow the property owner to make a little bit more money on that historic house. It makes, them, it makes the ownership of a large house possible, financially feasible, but it also lets people who don't make as much money um, live downtown, which is one of the challenges moving forward as we talk about what's gonna happen in the, in the coming years. That is a challenge that Lexington has to figure out. We have to make sure that we can actually have everybody of all income levels living downtown. It's not, we don't just want it to be a, an area where um, you know, wealthy folks can live or, or, or not. You wanna have, in order to be a vibrant city, it has to be a place where everybody can enjoy for a variety of different reasons. So. Um, not to say that's necessarily what you're going for, but I would say go keep pushing for the ADUs and see what you can come up with. Yeah, thank you for that, Doug. And I would also add in, and Hal, I would ask you to correct me if my memory is wrong here, but hopefully the ADUs aren't um, under the bridge yet. I, I'm hoping that they can still move forward. I believe they're going to be presented um, along with possibly public comment at the Planning and Public Safety Committee on September 14th. So I would encourage you all to um, come in and weigh in and express your thoughts on that matter. It is a really good opportunity to meet a lot of needs, both socioeconomic, um, reduce car usage because you can walk from where you're at, which we know it's really expensive to own a car, especially if you're in certain income brackets. And the amount of money that our community is spending on housing is not sustainable across the board. So I think the ADUs could be a really good way to, to, to get a lot of birds with one stone. That's kind of a gruesome analogy. I should find an alternative to that. But I don't want to, no harm to birds. I like birds just fine. Um, so 
Yeah, that's great. Uh, we are really low on time. So I'm going to ask us to all kind of wrap up with our concluding questions just so we can get it on the Lex TV airtime. Uh, so if, Hal, would you like to take, take it from for this next one? I will go very quickly. Uh, <laughs> we always uh, talk about how the past is just this incredible thing that we can build upon. Uh, and I, I think that there are wonderful things that have occurred from every kind of portion of our background and some not so great things that have really limited our ability to develop. Um, when we look at it from a zoning perspective, that is a living document. It's representative of our past, but it is also uh, a document that is meant to be modified for our future. Uh, we have modified it in ways that have limited capacity, and we have modified it in ways that have uh, enhanced areas, whether it's through the inclusion of wider sidewalks that are meant to help people that uh, typically cannot uh, navigate on a three foot wide sidewalk, uh, or uh, it adds greater uh, flexibility in housing types. When we look at what has been developed in the past and we look at what we want for our future, uh, I, I think we need to uh, make sure that we're amending that zoning ordinance, that living document to reflect the, the common goals that we're trying to get to and, uh, and really focus on what is what can be produced and uh, take uh, those wonderful examples from the past and apply it into it. Thank you, Hal. Um, Peter, uh, can you give your final answer and comments? I don't know that I really have anything to say. <laughs> well, hopefully that means we've covered it really well already. Always more to say for sure, but, but that's great. And then last but certainly not least, Holly, can you wrap us up with any final comments for our audience today? I think this has been a great discussion and uh, certainly one of the the takeaways perhaps is the necessity of, of constantly evolving. And I think Hal spoke eloquently to that, the importance of, of having a responsive um, planning document, zoning document. When I did our tech, just very quickly, um, there was no infill uh, regulations. And I had to go through the board of, uh, of um, I can't even remember multiple Maybe boards. Adjustment, architectural review, adjustment, all of the above. Adjustment because <laughs> it was talking about uh, setbacks and garages, and you know we don't have that. And and so anyway, the good news is the planning documents have evolved to to allow um, urban infill to happen, and that's critical. So I salute the uh, planners in, in uh, Lexington for being responsive, and that's just we all have to work together. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, audience members on Zoom, now is a really good time to click all of those chat links that Valerie and Sam have been dropping. They're very useful. So if you want to do some follow-up investigations or outreach, um, click all those now. The time is running out. Um, if you are seeking AICP credits, this session is eligible. You can watch this webinar again or share it with a friend or colleague via our website, imaginelexington.com, or catch it on Lex TV on Saturday at 1 p.m. I want to extend a big thank you to our panelists, uh, Peter Bourne, Holly Wiedemann, Dr. Doug Appler, and Hal Bailey. Um, this one was coordinated by me, and AICP credit was obtained by Sam. Thank you, Sam. Um, we had live Q&A support from both Valerie Friedman and Sam Castro, technical support from Libby Jefferson, and we certainly appreciate our colleagues at Lex TV for supporting this broadcast. Uh, most of all, we want to thank our audience for being interested in this topic and joining us here today. Uh, the Mornings with Planning webinar series will continue to discuss new ways to reconnect, reimagine, and respond in a new reality, and we want to hear from you. What topics should we discuss as we move forward with Lexington together? You can email us at imagine at lexingtonky.gov to let us know. Uh, we will be back on the first Wednesday of next month, October 7th, where we will be discussing trees. For more information on future sessions, to access the recording from this webinar, and to learn more about planning in Lexington, visit imaginelexington.com or lexingtonky.gov forward slash planning and follow us on social media. Thank you for spending your morning with us and we'll see you next time.